like to welcome uh, Todd Hooper from Zipline Games. Clap, man. <laughs> All right. Good Thank you, Ed. Okay, so when Ed said, uh, let's find something to talk about in mobile games, and he said, put together your dream panel of people, I managed to get my dream panel up here. So what we're going to talk about is uh, bootstrapping a, a launch on uh, mobile titles. Um, if you've got a million dollars to launch your mobile title, please leave the room. Has anyone got a million dollars? No? Good. All right, you're in the right room. So there's 650,000 apps uh, in, uh, on the App Store right now. There's 600,000 on Google Play. Amazon has 30 to 40,000. The real interesting challenge is how do you actually launch a game successfully and get attention amongst all that, those people out there that are trying to get people's attention, whether it's games or other apps there, they're trying to get people to download. So um, people on the stage here have done it successfully. Um, I've had a little bit of experience at it, so I thought it would be interesting to uh, run through, talk about some of the, the decisions that they went through, way back to even what platforms to target, and then how to actually launch an, and market an app. So uh, I'd like you guys to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. So David, uh, David Ettery, Sprite Fox. Yeah, I'm the CEO of Sprite Fox. Started about uh, two and a half years ago. And um, people think of us as a mobile studio, and we've done a bunch of mobile stuff, but we actually um, have more games on the web than on mobile. And I still kind of consider us a, a figuring out the whole mobile thing, although good, good start at it. Figuring it out pretty well. <laughs> Randy? Hi, my name is Randy. I'm the co-founder of ZeroSoft Incorporated. We are a mobile games company that was formed about three years ago. Uh, my other co-founder and I were both ex-Amazon employees, and after we left the mothership, we decided it was a good time to start doing our own thing, and mobile games is where we went. Had seen some success so far, and hopefully we'll see it growing. And Berkeley. Uh, my name is Berkeley Malagon. I'm the CEO of DistinctDev. We made the game called The Moron Test, a mobile game for all sorts of platforms. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we started doing mobile in 2008. Before that, we were doing random experiments on Facebook, utilities, games, uh, social uh, utility stuff. Um, yeah, had some success with the Moron Test for the last few years, and looking forward to talking about that. So just to get an idea from the audience, who's actually got a shipping mobile game right now or uh, planning to ship one? All right, so pretty much everyone is in the target market. So. Let's, let's talk about platforms first. Um, obviously, the big dogs are, are Apple and Google, um, and I think uh, most of the folks here have had some experience with those platforms. Um, love to hear about your experiences with what platforms you really think about when you're thinking about the next game. Obviously, we're seeing Kindle really come up in the rankings. There was a news report this morning that uh, Amazon has five to six Kindles in development at the rate they're hiring people. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, but then I know, uh, Berkeley, you had experience with other platforms uh, with the early release of your games, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, the, our philosophy when we started with the Moron Test was uh, you, should be at a, you should be able to go to a party and uh, have someone see you play and hand it to anyone, and they should be able to go get the Moron Test. So we were actually across eight or nine platforms um, uh, with the Moron Test one, and, and uh, we were a small shop, it was three of us, so we started dealing with outsourcing and, and all that. So we, we were on uh, uh, Nokia Ovi Store, we were on we were on BlackBerry, um, we were just all over the place, Intel App Up. So uh, if I could uh, say anything about that whole experience, is it was it was not worth it for us. I, if, <laughs> I, I, I would say if, if, if I was looking for any silver lining, during that process, we discovered that Android was pretty cool before pretty much anybody was realizing that it was pretty cool. Um, so I'm glad that we found Android, but at this point, um, we, we just exclusively target iOS and Android. Randy? Cool. Uh, we got started on iOS, and all of our current games that are in production are on iOS. Uh, we currently have Android in development right now. Uh, we found iOS to do pretty much everything that we wanted to do. Android. Look, the numbers look good, and the numbers are where we want them to be, to be worth developing and spending time on Android. But it's pretty painful so far, and I, there are many days I wish it were more like iOS. There's all these little design choices where you look at it, and you're like, you're so close to greatness, just a little bit further, but you did it. So here we are. Shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no worries. It's a game development conference. People swear all the time. All right. That's <laughs> cool, then. The, um, we... So it's interesting. Uh, we, we have this philosophy that we want our games to be everywhere, but there's a sort of an important, uh, there's an important caveat to that, which I'm sure you'll agree with, which is essentially like everywhere where it's worth our time. So, and how do you define worth our time? It's basically a side, it's just a question of numbers, right? So we'll look at a platform and we'll say one of two things. Does this platform 
have an existing population of people that is paying that's big enough for us to be excited about, um, or will it likely have it? You know, and how do you how do you know? You just well, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can you know, but you never know for sure. But you know, will it likely? And what's interesting is that it's not always the, the where that takes you isn't always obvious. So for example, a lot of people looked at us funny when we did, literally the first games we ever released, the first two games we ever released were for the e ink Kindle devices, not the Kindle Fire, the like the actual like, you know, Kindle One, Kindle Two sort of thing. And um, and uh, a lot of my friends thought we were kind of nutty for, for, for doing that, but we did it for a very simple reason. It was because we looked at that and we were like, well, gee, there's a significant population of users on that platform that don't currently have any games to choose from who, are, who have a predisposition to spend large amounts of money on digital content, like way more than average, right? They'll, they'll spend 15 or 20 bucks for a digital book, you know? Like, we can't send, like, super highly, pol sell super highly polished games for more than 99 cents on, you know, the iPhone, right? So that sounds pretty good to me. Like, even if it's one hundredth of the, you know, or not hundredth, but like one fiftieth of the audience size, one twentieth of the audience size, the fact that they might be willing to spend 15 times as much, you know, was a really interesting notion. So we ended up taking games there. That's actually where Triple Town, a lot of people don't know this, but Triple Town didn't start off on Facebook. Triple Town started on the e Kindle device, and it actually did pretty well there. Um, it could have done better. I actually think Amazon has made a lot of like sort of atrocious mistakes in terms of how they've been managing that ecosystem in particular, which thankfully they haven't repeated uh, on Kindle Fire. Um, but uh, but you know even with all the mistakes that I believe they made, like we still made you know multiple many times our, our development cost, our development investment on the on Triple Town uh, on the Ink device. So anyway, the, the long story short is when you're figuring out where to put your game. Like if you're if you're like us, you'll think, well, I want it in as many places as possible, but I want to make sure that I can get a return. And how do you figure out the return? It's like, okay, what's how much competition will I have on that platform? How good is my relationship with the platform holder? Like, meaning, are they going to feature my game or not? Because that's obviously going to dictate how much traffic I get to a large extent. Um, what is people's willingness to pay? Like, there's a lot of different questions you can ask yourself, and most developers don't ask themselves these questions at all, right? Like, most developers are just like. I hate to say it, the game game developers tend to be like lemmings. They're like, "Where is everyone else running? Woohoo! That looks like a good cliff. Let's go!" <laughs> and like, that's it. Like, that's how 99% of game developers pick where they're going to put their next game. And that's why there's so many, you know, like, and not to say that. Like, I mean, again, I, I love like we've made tremendous amounts of money off of um, off of iOS, and we have fantastic relationships with the people at Apple, and I'm really glad that we're developing games for that ecosystem. But you know, it's always a little bit strange to me to talk to someone and they're like, "Oh yeah, all I'm doing is iPad. That's it." Oh, really? Okay. And why are they doing that? Well, because they've heard stories about other people making tons of money there, and it's just a strange way to me of deciding how you're going to base your company's you know, future. Right. So uh, speaking of uh, other platforms, Kindle, I've, I've heard some positive notes there. And yeah. are, you, are you guys on Kindle? Roughly? Yeah, yeah, we are on Kindle. Um, I, I think we were, were, we were more excited, excited around uh, Christmas it's because of that surge. Right. So we really thought it was going to be a huge contender in the Android space. And I think it could still become that. But for us, uh, as a premium app, it's 99 cents. Um, it, it just hasn't uh, been as impressive as it started off at. So I think there's a lot of potential there, but we're still not super jazzed. And yeah. no love for, I'm not hearing any love for Windows. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> well, actually, yeah, they're over the pond there. <laughs> Windows 8 may end up being a massive. I mean, I would be surprised if Windows wasn't a massive opportunity, honestly. It's just by definition, it's going to be so many people are going to have Windows 8 you know, machines soon enough that um, I actually, I mean, that's one of those things where, yeah, there's lots of reasons to be skeptical. But uh, again, speaking about, like, just probably, like I was saying, like, look at a market. You know, what do the odds look like? You know, does it look like it's likely to have a big audience? No matter what you think of Microsoft, Windows 8 is likely to have a big audience, right? I mean, it just is. So you wouldn't be ex Microsoft by any chance, would you? I would be ex Microsoft, <laughs> but to be fair, actually, just so just just for the record, like I'm probably one of Microsoft's like harshest critics because yeah. I like I know from the inside how broken that place is, and it's super broken. But 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 that said, like it's Windows 8. Like I mean, it's like yeah. the next major operating system. I mean, Mac hasn't destroyed Windows yet. Linux hasn't destroyed Windows yet. It's not going away tomorrow. So yeah, no, that's significant. On the Kindle Fire point, I actually agree. I, mean, I actually think it has a lot of potential, and that's why I invest in it. And we know a lot of people at Amazon, and they're very nice and, um, and very accommodating, and so it's, it's been great working with them. But, um, but we also haven't necessarily seen the results that we wanted to see. And I think a lot of that has to do with, partly it's just, you know, it's a new platform. You know, they're still working out the kinks. Partially it's that they're merchandising, which is weird because it's Amazon. You'd think they understand merchandising backwards and forwards. Merchandising's not so great in there. Like, I think they have a hard time drawing eyeballs to the to the to, to new and great content um, a much harder time than 
uh, uh, than, uh, than you know, Apple or Google, for example. Um, and, uh, and again, that's an easy thing to fix, relatively speaking. So I suspect that the Fire will be a great, <clears throat> a great platform for games in the future. And I know already to this, you know, today that some developers are making money hand over fist there. We're just not one of them. We saw our highest alpha ever on Kindle Fire, which surprised me. But like you said, there's not that many. They've only been shipping them for, what, nine months? So, yeah. so uh, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, premium titles, and I think there's a mix of premium and freemium between you guys. Um, can you tell me about some of the thought processes that went into into that? And David, you said earlier that you, you love, you can't imagine doing a premium game again. Um, but then Berkeley, you guys have done pretty well with premium. So. Love to yeah, that. so I think uh, a lot of that has to do with what team you have and what you're confident building. I think that freemium at Distinct Dev just isn't our, our DNA yet. So I, I just didn't feel comfortable making that swap. And also, we, there's a lot of benefits to the premium side. If, for us, we, we don't have to spend that much money on marketing because it's, it's way more uh, stable on the premium side. So we're not constantly battling for that rank spot. So it's a, it's a stable, predictable business. So that's, we, we enjoy that. <laughs> Um, I mean, that, that's worth a lot. I mean, yeah. So let's be clear. For those of you who don't know, like, the level of competition for a top 10 spot on the free charts is insane. Like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how many downloads you have to get to get into the top. Tri for those of you who don't know, because Triple Town has been, I think, on mobile, both Android and iOS, we've got something like five or six million users at this point. So it's a good number, right? Triple Town has never been in the top 50 on iTunes, ever. Not in the top 50. Like, think about that for a minute. We have six million users. Well, no, on Apple it's three, but like, nevertheless, three million. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard. Whereas on the paid charts, you can get in the top five with a tiny fraction of what we've got. So that's actually something worth knowing. Yeah. It used to be a lot easier on the free side too. You could still do the paid install thing, and then we would do back in the day when it was still all right. You'd be able to buy fifty, sixty thousand downloads over the course of a day or two, and boom, top ten right away without even batting sweat. But that's been cut off. So. Too bad. We're gonna, we'll come back to that topic of yeah. PPI as well. Mm -hmm. so, so Berkeley, how do you keep people engaged in the game um, with, the, with the premium game? You, you're always releasing new content for free? For yeah, that's, that's basically the main, the main game. For, for us, uh, 99 cents is pretty much the, the goal. So once somebody gives us 99 cents, we're, we're pretty much done getting money from them for, for, for directly. So we go for uh, having a bunch of inherently viral stuff to do which is puzzles. You want to test your friends. So we just try to come up with more puzzles that reinvigorate everybody and they start sharing it. We see evidence of that on social media and, and in the ranks. So that, that's our whole, that's our whole uh, life, coming up with puzzles and keeping people in, interested through puzzles. Right. So uh, it's, 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 it's a lot less opportunity to do uh, cool upsell stuff. We actually did an experiment where when we launched our sequel, uh, it had one, one uh, level and the other level you could uh, you could buy for 99 cents. It burned all goodwill with our fans. They hated us, and it also didn't work that well. We had an okay conversion rate, so we just were done with trying to sell the actual uh, not consumable content uh, with in-app purchases. So th that's that's where we're at now. And then for the, the guys that you are doing more freemium, um, you know, the majority of the business is at the in-app purchase. Um, I mean, we hear a lot of stuff about ads. You see ads in Angry Birds, but our experience has been that unless you're I mean, even at the scale of uh, Triple Town, you're not at any scale where you can really make a lot of revenue from ads. I mean, it's not it's not mm -hmm. trivial. Like, if we wanted to, we could be making like something certainly that would matter to the company, right. but it wouldn't be. Yeah, it's not like it's not gonna. You're not gonna like go buy a new house because of the ads that you put in Triple Town. So right. like, and so we haven't. Right, there's no ads in Triple Town. The the, um, you know the the thing is that at the end of the day, it's amazing the extent to which. There's almost nothing you can do in a free-to-play game that won't piss off somebody, right? Like, th that's just how consumers are. Like, it doesn't matter how much free content you give them. It doesn't matter how enjoyable your game is. It doesn't matter how, how few limitations you put on the experience. Someone is going to always complain. And what we found is ads, and this is, this is not, this is, like, just our experience. There's lots of companies that make tons of money off of ads, so, you know, whatever. You know, take it with a grain of salt. But, um, but in our experience, ads tend to enrage people more than the money they bring in is worth it. Um, we may still try them again in the future. Like we have, there's like little things that I've been intrigued by recently. Like there's this company called Keep. I don't know if you guys are any of you familiar with K I I P. But so Keep is, you know, Keep is this interesting thing where like when someone gets an achievement in your game, you can be like, oh, congratulations on getting that achievement. Here's also a 25% off uh, cup of coffee at Starbucks. 
and of course, like that 25% off is an advertisement. Like Starbucks is more than happy to give that, and in fact, pay you to give that away because you know it might bring people to their store, and they're making way more than 25. You know, like they're hoping to make way more than that off of uh, off of the customer, um, the 75% that remains. I mean, so so like that's a kind of advertising that. I'm kind of curious about it. I'd like to try it. It doesn't seem so invasive. It seems like it will li likely result in less complaining, but I wouldn't be surprised if it triggers a huge backlash and we have to rip it out. I mean, who the hell knows, right? So bottom line is, like, if I'm going to, if I'm going, every, everything is going to piss off our customers, so if I'm going to, I'm going to pick the thing that is least likely to piss them off and make the most amount of money, and that's usually some form of in-app transaction that's really subtle. You know what I mean? That like you can play the game without it. You don't have to buy it if you don't want to. The game is still tremendously amount of fun. But if you're really enjoying the game, it might enhance your enjoyment slightly, or it might give you a small boost in performance or whatever. And that that tends to be the best ratio of rage to profit, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Well, we've actually had a very different experience with advertisements on our side. In fact, we've worked with Keep for the last few months, so I'll speak about that briefly. Uh, now, that said, to, to your point about ads causing a lot of rage, I think it depends a lot on what kind of ad you're delivering. Like you see interstitials, nobody likes interstitials, it just, that is very rage inducing. Yeah. What we've done with our games is we predominantly use video ads, and they're always at points that are optional. So if you run out of some resource in the game, you want to get more premium currency, watch a video ad, watch a whole bunch of video ads, and slowly build it up that way as another avenue for people to gain premium currency in a premium game as opposed to flat out buying it. And we found that that's worked really well because it's never required, we won't push it on you, but if you want it, hey, it's there. Um, at the same time, we've seen with Keep, um, oh, sorry, let me rewind for a second. So advertisement, for us at least, counts for about 20% of revenue, and so it's actually been a fairly big contributor to us. Now that said, the Keep side of things has not been a very big contributor to us, but it has done fairly well for both our retention and our uh, daily usage rates. So that's actually gone pretty well. The payout rates for Keep and the numbers that you'll typically see, at least that we've seen, just aren't that fantastic and are maybe, I don't know, a small fraction of what we see with video ads. Mm. Uh, that's but that's again, so you're not just shoving video ads in people's face. That's the clear point. It's like, right. if you want more of this currency that we've built in that you could have otherwise bought, in other words, you did do the transaction thing, right? You have an right. FM transactions, and this is an end run around them. Right. So as long as it's something you're not shoving in someone's face, you're going to be okay. And you can do that with ads, too. It's just... Yep easier with video ads, I think, than the interstitials where it's just like slap, here you go, watch our stuff and make us money. Uh, what about uh, TapJoy? Have you guys, how do you guys feel about putting a TapJoy type off a wall in, in the game? And, uh, you know, as you said, Randy, I mean, well, our, our approach has been, if you need free coins, there's a section called free coins and there's ads and there's TapJoy and things like that, and you can go there, but if you don't go there, then it generally doesn't jump in your face. Mm -hmm. You maybe make an exception if you're detecting a low coin balance and you think right. the person's mm -hmm. likely to watch an ad. Yeah. But uh, things like Awful Walls, have those worked for you? Uh, well, we've actually been excommunicated for the most part from TapJoy because they're like, you're using Flurry, you can go piss yourself. We don't want to talk to you anymore. Oh, really? When you're done with Flurry, <laughs> we'll talk to you again. But until then, right. we're done. Okay. Uh, but Flurry's been really good for us for the last few years, just doing video ads and all their uh, paid installs earlier, too, before the videos came around. So things have been pretty good, but Awful Walls, we've pretty much never done. We might do it as a friend promotion, as a cross-promotional thing between some other mm -hmm. company that we know, we've known each other for a while, then we'll both set up offer walls and we'll do that for each other, but never through anything like TapJoy, just because they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. yeah well, that's all right. <laughs> Flurry's doing pretty well, so Good. pretty happy about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've used the offer wall from TapJoy and it's worked fine for us, but I, I'm actually really, we've been looking at incentivized video a lot because mm -hmm. we think that that's, that's a really good option. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so yeah, anyway, the offer wall, the problem is that all of these things are multipliers, right? So like, it's like, offer wall will work great for you if you have a very successful game that has like, something in it that people want to buy. If you don't, then the offer wall is useless to you. Right. So it's a very, it's very much a chicken and egg problem. Like you, you have to design that game that is going to have, a, you know, that, that you have to, you know, that, that walks that line that creates just enough, pr you know, subtle desire, you know, in the user to actually buy something. And until you do that, like none of the things we're talking about work, right? Like the incentivized video ad, why would you watch a video ad if you don't care about the currency? Why would you watch, you know, why would you go to the offer wall if you don't care about the currency? Like you have to care about the currency, that's the bottom line. Right, the game actually has to be good and then people have to get engaged in the game. So, so um, before you do that, and uh, you know, this is one of the things that you mentioned earlier, David, um, how do you get the game out there and get people to have a look at it? How do you test it first to make sure it doesn't blow up in people's hands? But then how do you get that initial engagement? Um, you know, we've obviously been doing a lot of stuff like GeoBetas in Canada. Right. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. I'll sing the praises of, of Canada to anybody. Yeah. Uh, is that an approach that you guys have used? What, what do you do when you, you think the game's ready and you want to put it out there, especially on 
platforms that are a little more complicated, like Android, where there's more moving parts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, well, there's a couple different answers to that. Partly, it's, it's just, yeah, it's exactly like you said. It has become super common for people on mobile to just say, I'm going to put my game out in Canada only, specifically Canada. That's become, like, the, the place for beta testing your game. Um, even, you know, every, every developer of free-to-play games I know is basically re releasing first and foremost there. And that gives you a chance specifically to do two things. To A, just see how users like the game, and B, also to see... You know, oh gosh, on only on iPhone 4 running 4.31 of the operating system does this particular bug appear? Because you're never going to find every possible bug in QA. It's just not going to happen. Um, so that's that. But that said, what makes us, I think, a little different from most game developers is that we typically do most of our quote unquote uh, like play testing um, in on the web. Like so, we'll we'll release a flash version of our game, and we will see how people like it, and we will get it to the point where. Uh, we actually have a very simple system, which is like we want the game to be getting a four out, at least a four out of five user score on whatever Flash portal we put it on. So Congregate or Newgrounds or whatever. Like if we don't have a four, like 3.94, if we don't have at least around that level, we just won't re release the game to a wide audience. We won't do it. And we'll just keep working on it and trying to improve it until we get it to the point where it has that kind of a score. Because what we found is if you've got at least a four out of five, um, you can generally succeed. Like, and obviously that's, Kind of hand wavy, right? Like it's not there's no it's not it's not like there's a magical number, right? But roughly, if 80% of the people playing your game think it's pretty good, like you'll probably be okay as long as you do everything else, which we can talk. Everything else being a big marketing thing that we'll talk about in a second. But like if your game is a three out of five stars, you're probably hosed, you know, unless you have a ludicrous marketing budget, which most most of us don't have. And why would you want to market a turd anyway? There's no no need to. It's not hard to make a four out of five game. So. Um, so, so we'll do that. We'll put it out, you know. And uh, and what's nice is that it used to be that you put it out in the Flash Portal ecosystem, and all you got was a big audience, which and, and and information. The information was super valuable. The big audience was also super valuable because you could upsell the premium version of the game to them. But nowadays, it's not just that. Nowadays, you can also actually have in-app trans, you know, purchases in your Flash game and actually make a tremendous amount of money on the web portals. So the web portals are this wonderful uh, one-two punch where you get information about your game and you also start making money off of your game before you even put it in a place where competition is, you know, trickier, like mobile. Um, so that's typically how we do it, actually. And then, yeah, once the mobile version is finally ready, assuming we're not doing a cross-platform launch and have shoved it all out at the same time, then we do the Canada thing, or theoretically, we've never actually done it before, but that's our plan coming up. <laughs> we're going to do the Canada thing, do it for a few weeks, make sure that there's no crazy crippling bug, which we've had every single game we've ever launched has had some crazy crippling bug that somehow slipped it past yeah. QA. Um, only on one device or two devices with one specific minor variant of the operating system, you know, and then you do your big launch. And then we can, I don't know, I've been talking too much, so I want to shut up, but like at some point we can talk about how do you actually get people to pay attention to the mobile game once you've launched it. Yeah, we've had very similar experiences now with, with Canada in particular. What we typically do is instead of looking at it from a rating basis of are we getting four out of five stars or whatever rating we might happen to be using at that time, we typically look at it more from a monetization perspective of are we getting enough revenue per user? Are we getting users acquired at the correct rate? Are we seeing retention at the right numbers? And if so, once all these things are finally worked out, then we're using that as an implicit way of saying, well, even though these people haven't given us actual reviews, the way that they're using the game and they're interacting with it is highly suggestive that they're all enjoying it and they're willing to pay us. So once we get it to that level, then we'll use that as a signal to kick it out. But again, just like with you, until we get it to that level where we're seeing the right numbers that we want to see, we'll just keep sitting it, leaving it Canada, tweak, 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 update in Canada, tweak some more, update in Canada, and once we get it, then we kick it worldwide and let it go live. And Canada and the U.S. being our two main markets, well, really the U.S. being our main market and Canada being a small, mini, mirrored version where, again, it is a great testing ground. So you can see all these wonderful things that you thought would be super cool and awesome sauce fall flat on their face and you go, okay, our bad. Let's try that one again. And then get it actually right and kick it out to the U.S. and really throw in a lot of money to do all the marketing stuff we'll talk about later and have it go off and make you gobs of money. Berkeley, Canada? Yeah, so I think uh, one thing that we should mention is that you guys are launching new games into Canada and then updating them there. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, we, we've had the same game in like the top 100 for like three years. So we, we were really intrigued by this idea about, about launching stuff in Canada, especially for us it's much more about game design or people getting through the content fine. Is, are there any issues with the puzzles? Is there a weird word we're using that is ambiguous or something? Um, and you, I don't think you can actually launch an update to a, a, a game that's already gone global Correct. just to a region. Oh, well, Zynga manages sucks. to do it somehow, but I've never seen anyone else do it. I presume Zynga has two separate games. They have a game for Canada, 
which is run at version one, launched, and then they launch version one worldwide, then they move Canada to version two, but they're actually separate games. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, it's a trick to the be trick. a relationship thing, I'm not sure. Well, it could be that too. <laughs> so uh, you guys talked about what you look for um, during those sort of periods of, of testing, and, and you know, we've done a two week and a six week Canadian trial um, over time. What, what do you typically look at, Randy? How, how long does it take you to? Uh, we do at least a month because you want to yeah. see what your retention times are over the course of that. Right. Six weeks is a little bit more typical. Sometimes if we look at the data and we say, well, we just don't quite have enough players to make a good estimate yet, we'll let it kind of bake a little bit longer, maybe do a small promo in Canada just to get some more eyeballs onto the game. And we re really won't want as much statistical significance as we can get from a small audience like you have in Canada, which is dwarfed by the U.S. Uh, so. A lot of times it's playing by ears, but I would say four to six weeks is a pretty good number for us in general. Two, two weeks definitely is not enough time because you, if you're on iOS, you have to consider that as a one-week review cycle, so any changes you make, if they're not changes you can make online to the game, then it's going to take you if it's like changes to the executable. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so talking of those analytics, what, what are the key KPIs then? You said revenue and engagement, Randy? Yeah, there's, re there's revenue per user, there's... Um, session frequency, there's retention time. Right. Those are the main ones that we really look for. And I mean, the key trump card is always going to be, are you generating enough revenue? Because that's gonna let, what's going to let you And one of those things that's kind of irritating about the app store is, I don't know what it is, as soon as you launch your game, you make this giant lump sum of money, and then it goes back down within the course of about two weeks. So if you don't even give it that time to prime, you're going to be looking at bad data, and you're going to way, way, way overestimate how much money you're actually going to make. That's been one of those little stumbling blocks that took us a try or two to figure out before, like, hey, something's not right here. Our numbers are all off. Um, but once we get those sorted out, that's, those are typically the ones we end up using because we want you to come back. We want you to spend money. Right. And once we got that, we're good. And Berkeley, I've seen you give a whole presentation on analytics, so Berkeley could talk about this else. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for us, it's, it's, a, it's a much smaller problem, so it's easier to nail it, I think. So it's, it's, we're a premium game. It's the main difference between uh, me and the other guys. Um, so it's 99-cent game. For, for us, it's, a completely, it's, it's completely a rankings thing. So uh, we really spend a lot of time understanding at what version of our game is how sticky so we understand, uh, given uh, we, we call it like time since last like touch. So if we've updated it or if we've done a campaign, we, we touched it, and uh, if we stop touching it, uh, how long is it before uh, it drops one spot? Like we just have this sticky coefficient that we use. So what that does for us is, it, uh, along with understanding how many downloads you need to be at what spot um, through your own historical data. You can uh, do cool things like, okay, well, I need to get this many downloads. That's going to cost me this much. And you can start predicting, given your decay rate out of the ranks, uh, how long before something becomes ROI positive. Or you can say this won't become ROI positive as a campaign. So um, for us, it's much more about just maintaining rank. Um, uh, we can get into marketing, and we have an interesting take on that. Uh, uh, yeah, but it, 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 those are the, basically the key performance indicators. What's our rank, basically, because we are a paid game. Right. Every right. download gets us money. So. And David, what are the KPIs that you look for? I mean, it's what these guys said, but I, we we've kind of simplified it in a way. I, I don't I don't I don't know if it's always healthy, but we, we've really boiled it down to retention for us, like literally just retention. And the reason we've done that is meaning how. When someone comes into the game, what's the likelihood that they'll be around for a day, for a week, for a month? And, and the reason we've done that is very simple. We, uh, perhaps it's a problem with hubris. We, we, we're, con we're convinced that if you give us enough time, we'll find a way to, like, to, mo you know, to monetize the game effectively. Um, we just need time to experiment. Um, and so the question is, will you give us enough time? Will you stick around, right? If you don't stick around, that's a problem, right? Especially since we have a habit of not spending money on user acquisition. We count on our partners to drive us. Um, you know, users by featuring our games and so on and so forth. So if we blow that one, two, or three features that Apple's willing to do or Google's willing to do, that's a real problem for us. Um, so that's why I said, like, we try hard to get make sure that our game is at that f at minimum four out of five rating before it goes out, and we try to make sure that it's holding on to the, the users who do come in that do stick around for a while. And then once they do, great. Now, okay, if we're not necessarily making a ton of money off of them in the beginning, th th that's okay. Like, we'll figure that out. That said, th that's probably bad. <laughs> we probably should be, we should probably be more concerned about revenue. And we are, I mean, like, like I would have picked the same three if I had to pick three. But what I'm saying is if you have to only pick one, then pick retention because it's really expensive to buy users and then lose them, right? Like, or to be featured and then not keep those users. That's the single worst thing that can happen to you, in my opinion. It's, it's really hard to, to 
understand which ones to focus on because when you have an analytics package, they just offer you so much. I mean, you can slice the data a million ways and it's updated in real time. So if you're obsessive compulsive like I am, you can be sitting in bed at two in the morning, checking your analytics just before you go to sleep and then you get up at four, did anything change? <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. You guys get addicted to it, right, as well? Oh, there's yeah. no question. It's like right, your, your professional high scoreboard, right? Like yeah, you just right. sit there and you're like, woohoo, I'm up <laughs> 10 points today. <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah. Awesome. So, um, you talked about getting featured, David, and uh, we've been lucky enough to be featured once. I know uh, you guys have been featured a couple of times. How does that happen? Uh, I guess I know how it happened for us, but right. most developers I speak to, I'd be like, yeah, you've got this great game. You know, how are you launching it? They probably tell me that they're going to do a light version and a paid version and all the things that would have been great ideas two years ago. Um, they don't really ever reach out to Apple or Google or Amazon or anybody. Um, and I, I guess that's one thing that I would encourage people to do. Um, how's that work for you guys? I don't know. I don't know how representative. I mean, I don't know how much people can take away from our story. So, for example, like we, we were giving, we were taking, we were taking Google seriously well before anybody else was in, in terms of Android specifically. Um, and because we brought them good games before most developers were even taking them seriously, they now, they now have some amount of loyalty in return to us. And obviously that moment's gone now, right? Like now, you know, Google Play is a very successful marketplace, and so that's not really an opportunity that you can replicate, although you can with the next great platform, whatever that is, if you try to keep an eye out, which is, of course, back to my E and Kindle story, why were we doing that? Well, we were hoping to form a relationship early on. Um, but so there was that. Uh, but in general, I guess if I, had to, if I had to just kind of say what can a developer today who doesn't necessarily have that timing advantage do, um, I would just say, you know, if you have a developer, a friend who's a developer, this is probably the best way. If you have a developer, a friend who's a developer who has the respect of Apple, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, any of those guys, um, and that person is willing to just do something as simple as send an email to their contact and go, hey, I think my friend's game is pretty good. Would you take a look at it? That's probably the smartest thing you can do. Because the problem is if you simply try to cold call them, like, Oh God, they get so many emails, right? There, it is, it is overwhelming. I, can, I mean, I actually can speak about this from firsthand experience. I used to be the portfolio manager of Xbox Live Arcade, and it's, 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 it's crazy to like wake up in the morning and look in your inbox and there's like you know, 20 emails there from people you've never met, all of whom want you to play their game, which you can't possibly do. You don't have enough hours in the day, right? And so you automatically filter on, this was a forward from a guy I trust. This is somebody who you know went to the same school I did. Like whatever, right? Like any whatever your metric is, like that's what you'll do. So if you're in the situation, if you're in a position of I have a game that I think is great, but I don't know how to get it in front of you know someone at these platforms. First of all, don't give up. Get it in front of someone at those platforms. You're making a mistake if you don't. And second of all, like I said, if you have someone who can make the introduction, so much the better. Um, if you don't, maybe you can try to meet them at conferences. They tend to be hanging around places like this and GDC and stuff, you know what I mean? Like, so try to find where they are. If they're giving a lecture, which they oftentimes are, attend that lecture and wait in however hell the long the line is afterwards to give them your card, you know what I mean? Like, don't, don't be shy because there are lots of people who won't be if you are. Cool. We've actually never been featured. I have no idea what to tell <laughs> about how to do it. We've always gone through smaller guerrilla strategies. We can talk about that afterward right. if you like that. Right. Yeah, actually going to conferences has worked for us. Um, there was a meeting at Google last year. We walked in, caught up the Google guys and showed them the game and they're like, oh, this is really cool. We'd love to do something with that. So a lot of it is actually getting on a plane and flying down to California every couple of weeks and just being at events and meeting people. It's not what you know, it's who you know. So um, great, so you're ready. You, you've tested in Canada for six weeks or the Philippines maybe. Um, uh, you're gonna do a launch. Uh, you know, the way that we did our first game was a, was a traditional launch with PR releases and some videos and stuff like that. Um, the current game we're working with, thinking of just soft launching. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what works on those days, what drives traffic on those days. Um, is a launch day really a special day? Because it is obviously for a console game or something big like that. But for mobile, it's, it doesn't seem like it's actually that important. Um, are there things that you guys think about on launch day that are different from any other day? Do you do traditional press? Uh, not really. I mean, we kind of, it's, we're really bad at press. Like, we're just <laughs> bad at it. We're, uh, um, we, know that it, we know that it can help, um, but there's so many other things we're focused on, and we're such a small team that that's typically been the last thing we focus on. And, you know, so we'll, like, send a few emails to a few people that have written us in the past at, like, Touch Arcade and so on and so forth. And generally, they're nice enough to review the game, and that's great. But, like, we're, we're, super, we're super haphazard about it. And I, I will say that, I mean, so 
part of the problem is that in, on, in mobile in particular, actually even worse in the flash portals, like because nobody pays attention to those. Like there's the press doesn't tend to seem to move the needle all that much. Like you can get like a really nice write up and you know in a major you know major major online publication and it'll drive like a thousand users. Right. Right. Which is like one thirtieth of what Apple might send me in a single day if they put me in new and noteworthy. So, and I'm not just picking that number out of the hat, it's probably somewhere between 120th and 150th, you know what I mean? Like it's that small. So, so, um, so we tend to not, we find that when, when we focus, because we have on at least one occasion tried to take press more seriously, and which is, I think it's not a bad thing to do, but we find that it tends to stress us out in a way that's not healthy. We're like, oh man, it's just got to be, everything's got to be perfect today because today is when the game is going to get reviewed and like, oh man, and. And that's just so counter to who we are as a studio. Right. So, like, we try to avoid the whole launch, today's launch day thinking, and instead just focus on, you know, getting the game out there, dealing with any bugs that show up, and again, you know, trying to retain as many people as possible that, of, the, of those that who do come in, and not worry so much about. Now that said, because we do also try to count on try, you know, trying to get featured. Um, there's going to be if that ha if we do get featured, this huge amount of traffic comes in, you have to deal with it. So again, like, how do you prepare for that? You prepare for that by having tested in Canada and so on and so forth, and like, and then it just kind of happens, and you roll with it and hope that nothing blows up. You know what I mean? Like, you, but that, that's, I mean, gosh, I guess that's our strategy. Like, hope something doesn't blow up. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed Google testing people now. By the way, before you get featured, they send you a little bit of traffic. Oh yeah. Yeah, just I guess to, to test if it doesn't blow up. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I don't understand what the other any other reason would be. So, uh, guys, PR launches. Yeah. Um, for launches on launch day. What we've actually typically seen is if we do nothing and we just sit back and let it do its thing, we'll see a nice little bump as you show up in the what's been released lately on the iTunes store. And that's cute, cuddly, but ultimately not too helpful. And what we typically end up doing, though, is using that more as a little bonus download number. And this isn't, doesn't really help if you haven't launched an app yet, but having a few apps in our portfolio so far and being all freemium games, what we can essentially do is kind of cheat the system a little bit you didn't hear that from me, <laughs> and basically take all our other games and say, well, cool, on this day, we're going to say, download our brand new app, and we'll drop you some virtual currency of whatever, and it's essentially a paid install. But we do it across our entire game platform, or all of our games, and everybody goes and funnels over. We don't care if they stay or not. It's not the point. The point is to get those download numbers up. Sometimes they convert to, and they'll decide that they want to play this game instead, and granted, there's some cannibalization, but you have that old dodge, but it's better for you to cannibalize your own users than for somebody else to take them. And so we've used that as our main way of pushing a lot of downloads at once. And having it on launch day is nice, a few extra thousand downloads, just because that's the way the App Store works. But if it's not on that day, it doesn't matter. Uh, likewise, we sometimes coordinate with other advertisers as well. We might work with Flurry, we might work with friends. We'll say, hey guys, we're having a launch on this day. It'd be super awesome if you could push a bunch of our users our way, and we owe you one, we'll get you next time when you launch. And that works magically, and you just pop yourself all the way up on the charts, let those organics take off, and ride that way for a while until you decide to do it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying hearing some of the differences, because as a premium game for us, uh, we don't want to go into the ranks if there's any possible chance that there's a bug or something. Mm -hmm. So we're way more conservative around launches. We don't, we don't blast uh, anything out to users. We don't try to redirect people over to the game yet. We do some of that once we're confident and try to get up in the ranks. So uh, when we launched uh, uh, the Moron Test 2, um, it was right, right around Christmas that we got caught up in this launch mentality and uh, we really did uh, plan all these campaigns around it and, and uh, there was a crashing bug on like an iPhone, like, like on an iPod blah mm -hmm. with this OS on it. And of course, it, we just got owned. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what, if I can go back, what I would do is definitely stick to we're, we're, we, we need to get it right. We're not going to try to think, we're not going to get caught up in this launch mentality and, and have all this press lined up. And it gets you thinking in that way, whereas we're not shipping like a product that someone's going to hold. We can still work on it. So just launch that way. But this is, I mean, this is worth emphasizing. For anyone in this audience who's been doing games for a long time, it's like it's been for so long in this industry, the, the moon launch thought process, right? The like, launch day, yay, all guns blazing, we're going to succeed or we're going to fail. And like that, that I really cannot emphasize how, how counterproductive I think that is. 
Like it's just not necessary. You can seek, you can succeed in the space without it, and you probably are more likely to succeed in the space without it. And you're hearing all of us say some flavor of that, right? Like, yeah. don't obsess about your launch day. That's not how it works. Yeah, don't let Apple dictate your launch day. You can kind of choose it on your own too, which is really the approach we've taken. Because we still kind of have that moon launch kind of mentality to it, but it's at our timing, at our choosing. We can say, oh wait, some one of our main providers is not going to be able to help us out on that day. Well, all right, hold off on our own launch. We are in control of that. But when that day comes and everybody's coordinated, it really, really boosts you up. Just don't sweat it because it's Apple's launch day. Yeah, you get a few extra thousand downloads. It really doesn't matter when you're pushing 50, 60,000 downloads at one time. It'll drop you from what? 10 to maybe 11, maybe? It really doesn't make much of a difference with those extra thousand downloads, so don't sweat it. I would actually recommend that you think about your launch date as uh, the beginning. Yeah. That's, that's when you're going to start fixing stuff. You expect stuff to be broken. Stuff needs to get tweaked. It's just you're not done yet. You, 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 you can celebrate with your team as if you just launched. That's what we do. But uh, you, you really do expect the hard work to come after the launch. Yeah, much to what we just, or sorry, Berkey just said. I don't think we've ever had a launch that went bug free. That just doesn't happen. Something will crash. Something will go horribly wrong with some version somewhere. And that's just the way it goes. I'm feeling much better about our launches now. <laughs> Everyone's had a terrible bug. Yeah. <laughs> we've never launched. We've Slots launched Tycoon, we haven't had any, we're like 0.5% crash rate over mm -hmm. six weeks, so I'm feeling pretty good about that nice. one. <laughs> Rapid <laughs> learning. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of the interesting things that we learned, I think, with Wolf Toss was um, just to talk about the Canadian and the, and the launch day, was you have to have automated crash reporting in your game. And uh, if you don't have that and you rely on what Google and Apple does, it's not that good. You really want to have, we use criticism. It's built in. Something crashes anywhere in the world within 30 seconds, I've got an email in my inbox, basically. And that gets people's attention, right? If there's all these emails coming up, oh, this just crashed a thousand times. And criticism will not just show you how many crashes you had, but it'll show you exactly what percentage of DAU that is. You only need three to 4% of people to get a crash to adversely affect your ratings. And so on iOS, we were rock solid, but on Android, we just had not done our homework, frankly, and we saw definitely lower ratings. And when we fixed those, people came back, they appreciated, they bought stuff, and the ratings went up, and the game did better. So, yeah, not very good is a very generous way of describing what Apple and Google give you. So. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 you know you know I'll give Google credits. They they right. they've moved forward on the Google Play experience, and they they're doing more stuff and giving you more data. Mm -hmm. One thing that Google has in their advantage, if you have a crash, you can fix it as soon as you can fix it in your office and then push it. With Apple, you got a crash, you got a week until you can get that crash fixed to people and that can be the most painful week on earth because you can watch your game plummeting through the rankings, mm -hmm. you know, your re terrible reviews, customer support, I'm sorry we've got a fix. I mean, people will pull their game from the store normally that, rather than, than actually suffer with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. So, um, User acquisition, uh, it's probably the most complex topic. Uh, we've got another 15 minutes, so let's spend the rest of the, the time talking about this and we'll have a little bit of time for questions as well. Um, many ways to do it. Um, you know, TapJoy is one way to get users. Um, Chartboost is another. You can run mobile banner ads. There's plenty of folks out there that'll take your money for running ads. Um, you can cross promo. Chartboost is a cross promo service. You can build your own cross promo service. What have you guys used? Um, I know it's going to differ uh, based on the sort of games that you're doing, but what's worked for you and what hasn't worked? And, and I, t I'll, I will say one thing, reviews typically don't seem to really work anymore. Um, there's plenty of reviewers out there. They're sort of hard to get hold of now uh, because they're so slammed with mobile launches. They typically seem to go more for premium and retro titles that fit their specific thing. If you have a freemium title, they're generally not going to jump on it and want to review it. Um, so there's, you've got to find some other way to get the news out about the game. What is it that you guys have found that works? Uh, I'll go first. Um, one thing that we, we realized early on doesn't work for getting downloads is uh, press to the industry. We, mm -hmm. we used to put a lot of energy into there and uh, uh, we enjoyed getting talked about about being so cross-platform and that sort of stuff, but it didn't really move the needle on downloads. So that's one thing that didn't work. Um, well, one thing that used to work really well is the TapJoy campaign and we had that down to a science. and. Um, you have to remember again we're we're a paid game, so um, it, we were able to figure out what multiple of a ninety nine cents we were able to pay to, to and still be ROI positive. What didn't work as a paid game for us, and what continues to not work, is uh, display ads. We we just won't just blast money out there for random placements on on display ads, uh, especially as a paid game. Um, uh, the TapJoy CPI campaign thing. Uh, 
just isn't the same anymore uh, as uh, a free app will pay you know multiple dollars for for a user a, a paid app just practically can't spend enough money to to get a user fast enough to to make an impact on the rankings so um, what we've focused on and this sounds like we're padding when different players have come through and you in turn can send callbacks back up to them to say person X who came from your campaign Y has finally bought something in our game and then fix to internal say well hey cool this advertising channel seems to be bringing in paying users let's show more ads and funnel more money towards them and try to optimize your advertising spend for you without you having to do very much and I think there are some other services that do similar thing too they just happen to be the one that we came across first and decided to give a try uh, also going with advertising with friends is incredibly incredibly helpful especially since you can it's in many ways it's leveraging what you have available to you once you've built out a game or two you can say here are my games let's just push people over and really affect those download numbers now you've got some friends let's all band together and really push a download number really high and then we can go and turn through each person so that we make sure everybody puts in something and they get something back out for it we'll all have our turn in the limelight and really make something stand out uh, these things have all been very, very effective for us on iOS specifically, it's just because your rankings are driven so much by your download numbers that as long as you can find some way to either throw money, throw goodwill, throw something at it, and get that ranking up, you're going to be okay. And it's very, very easy to recoup your investment on getting all of those downloads, as long as you hit the critical mass of breaking into the top. Because what we did try at one point was just doing a constant three, four, five hundred dollar spend on a day-to-day -day basis to try to pick up users constantly does nothing, and it just kind of throw money into this bottomless pit. Nothing happens. Conversely, you store that money up for a month and you blast it all out at once. It will definitely make an impact. So that's kind of the different ways we've looked at it so far, and what's worked for us. It's it's the opposite of the Madison Avenue strategy of drip feeding you a message every day, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually you want all the message in one 24-hour period. Right. That's well, that, that, again, that's because they're going for the, they're trying to get to the top of the charts. Right. right. That's, this is an artifact of the way the mobile ecosystem works. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. David, how do you acquire users? And we're still, we're, it's something we're still working on because we're a very small company, and so we've had to pick and choose where we invest our time, and most of my time, which I'm the person most likely to do this kind of thing, goes into stuff like maintaining good relationships with platforms so that I don't have to pay for users because they send them to me for free. Mm -hmm. So that's why every game, mobile game we've ever done has been featured at least once and usually more than once by the platform it's on. Um, it's a good strategy. Yeah, it, <laughs> I mean, it works, but, it, but it's, time is money, right? So like my time goes into that instead of, you know, figuring out how Fixu works. And so, you know, it's like there's not, it's not clear that there's a right or wrong answer here. We also will swap traffic, like, you know, this is, I think both of you mentioned this, we'll swap, we'll absolutely swap traffic with developers who we're friends with and whose games we like. We haven't done that a lot, but we've done it a little bit, and it's obviously been helpful, and we want to do that more in the future. Um, so, you know, and that, I keep hearing from successful indies that that's a major part, of, component of their strategy, where like, they'll get 10 or 15 other indies to all agree to, you know, feature, you know, to cross promo their game on the exact same day to try to, again, get them up the charts. But, you know, again, for better or for worse, we, we, we are really resistant. Like, even, as helpful as it is to climb the charts, we find that it's, that, that sort of, we're gonna push super hard on this one day mentality is, can be so harmful to our development process that we don't do it as much as perhaps we possibly should because we just don't want that kind of pressure. We just wanna put the game out in as many places as possible, get it as good as it can be, and count on the platforms to, to bring us the traffic that we think we deserve. So, so far that has kind of worked, but at the same time, like I said, Triple Town never even got into the top 50 on iOS, so yeah. who knows? So a uh, few more topics to discuss, but we're, we're not going to have time for those. But uh, I'd love to hear some uh, questions from the audience. I'm sure there's plenty of folks with questions. So does anyone want to throw a question out? Not a single question. Mike, you've got to have a question. <laughs> Sorry. This is Sorry. What are your thoughts on the, the social mobile platform that we offer that for I'm sorry, I could Agree or Papaya, the social mobile platforms. Yeah. So uh, for us, uh, at first, we came from Facebook where there was all these channels, uh, marketing channels, uh, uh, connecting with other players, and we, we, it was uncomfortable at first on mobile. And when we jumped all over OpenFaint when it, when it came out, uh, what we couldn't see was any measurable impact on things like retention or, or downloads. Was it causing downloads because because of some kind of cool emergent 
uh, behavior or something. It, it, we didn't see anything like that. For us, it was much more just like checking off the box that we have leaderboards and we have forums and that sort of just to fill up our description. And so we, we didn't see any 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 evidence that it actually helped with uh, retention, and maybe that's changed recently. But, um, I, and I expect something similar with with Game Center. I haven't seen any any actual evidence that it, it helps in that way. We initially started with a lot of social features in our game, not through Gree or any other platform, but just because my co-founder and I were both back-end guys. We've done a lot of that before. So building out our own social system inside is not very hard for us to do that. Your forums, your messages with players, uh, private or otherwise, all these things are fairly straightforward for us to build out. And when we first started, we had a lot of those features integrated. And over time, we've slowly dropped them because they just don't seem to do all that much. They're nice to have. But we've also seen, in a, when we do analytics over our own numbers, we'll see that most players will spend about 75%, if you're a, play, if you're a paying player, that is, you'll spend about 75% of what you're gonna spend within the first week. By the time you hit your first month life cycle, you've spent about 95% of what you're going to spend, averaged out at least, they're always the exceptions. But social features will keep you hanging around for a while, and that's cool, and it's nice to have that active ecosystem, but it just doesn't seem to contribute all that much to our final bottom line. I think it depends on the game, right? So it you, you have to assume that a game with, like Words with Friends has like a lot more bang for their buck social-wise mm -hmm. than right. I don't know. Pick almost any other social game, quite frankly. Oh, hopefully, they do. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> it right. seems to be working. Out it least. turns out that people playing these games in the bathroom and they don't feel like being social. <laughs> <laughs> but All right, I don't think we have time for any more questions, do we? Sorry, you can grab one of us after the panel. But uh, thank you very much.